Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Hank Weaver, welcoming you to another session of Hollywood Byline, Coast to Coast, and inviting you to listen in on an actual press conference with an outstanding Hollywood star. Tonight, our guest is the distinguished star of motion pictures, Mr. David Niffen, soon to be seen in the Powell Pressburger production, The Elusive Pimpernel. Mr. Niven will be interviewed by reporters whose beat is the film capital of the world. Reporters who know Hollywood inside out. Let's meet them now as we take a turn around our Hollywood press table and pick up their bylines. Lloyd Sloan, Hollywood Citizen News and Movie Life magazine. Mikhail Novak, Philadelphia Bulletin. Dar Smith, the Los Angeles Daily News. Sidney Skolsky, syndicated columnist, New York Post. That's the imposing array of journalistic talent you will have to cope with in the next few minutes, Mr. David Niven. But first, let me explain that after their barrage of questions lets up, you'll have a chance to ask some questions of your own. But now, as a warm-up, Dar Smith has an anecdote on the subject of one David Niven. Dar? At age 39... Start over again. You can add lint through this. Please do. At age 39, actor David Niven looks back over his life and to his horror finds that except for an 18th month period, except for an 18 month period, he has spent it in school, in the army, or under contract to producer Sam Goldwyn. These months, these 18 months, were spent operating a questionable pony enterprise in New York, ducking out just in time to Bermuda, engaging in a three day Cuban revolution, getting deported from Cuba, finding himself in San Francisco rather than Norway, where he intended to go, and finally being Shanghai aboard His Majesty's ship Norfolk. This rather flighty and precarious existence ended up in an acting contract with Sam Goldwyn, under whose colors he served valiantly for 14 years. This contract ended last July, and both parties appeared to be relieved that it did. We hope today, somewhere in this melange, Niven will see fit to tell you how he happened to get aboard that ship, His Majesty's ship Norfolk. And if he does, you will see how this charming adventurer, this sort of a soldier of fortune, a guy equipped with dinner jacket and thirst, became one of the really fine actors in motion pictures. (laughs) Mr. Niven. (laughs) I'd come out of the thing like a sort of... Drunken half with the thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, will you come now or will you stay, David? <laughs> I get to answer all those questions at once. First of all, my pony enterprise is not questionable. It was a financial disaster, but it was never in question. And the other thing you accused me of was being deported. I, um, I left. With the well, hurry, though. Hurry, though, wasn't <laughs> it? With was the utmost speed. <laughs> with the hot breath of several men in blue right down the back of my neck. (laughs) But then we'll get to how you ever got off the SS Sam Goldwyn. (laughs) Well, that was um, a sort of armistice first, and then it all ended very peacefully and very happily, and... And uh, uh, And you lived ever after. Lived, well, now four months since, and New Year we exchanged greetings as from old generals and rival armies, and we're very happy and we love each other, and I cannot wait to work for him again. Well, David, how about telling us about uh, how you really got Shanghai to board that uh, uh, battleship, the Norfolk? Well, I um, was in Cuba, and that was the place, as a matter of fact, that I left rather, rather hurriedly. The British consul advised that I, that I should be uh, the British subject. And there was, I, tried, uh, I made an elementary mistake. There was a revolution, well, a sort of shambles coming, and I made an elementary mistake, and I tried to get onto both sides at the same time. <laughs> and and uh, so the British consul recommended that I left, and I left, uh, that's the time I left quickly. Well, went, I'll get you out of Cuba. Uh, well, I got to Cuba. <laughs> I'll get Wait you out of it right here. Uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, please. Uh, oh. Uh, let him continue. Oh, story. I thought he wanted no, no, I thought you wanted No, there's a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. So uh, then I went down the canal, and I was going to catch a <laughs> Japanese ship it was going to Norway, which is the easiest way to get back to England. And it was called, I think, the Nanking Maru, or some kind of Maru, anyway. And um, I fell foul, happily, of the Marines off the American battleship, the Oklahoma. <laughs> and um, anyway, they put me in a something else Maru, and I went to San Francisco <laughs> <laughs> instead of going to Norway. And that's how I came to California. And do you want to know any more now? Yes, I'd like ahead. to ask a question, if I may. Uh, were you or were you not put on, forcibly or otherwise, onto His Majesty's ship Bounty? Yes, I was. 
I'm... Oh, there's a lead up to that, I think. Well, I have to get from San Francisco to, to, to the bounty now. And I'll Good. try it. Well, I only knew one person who lived in, in California at all, and she was a very nice girl called Lydia Macy. It's since happily married and, and uh, lives in Italy now. And uh, I called her up and I said, I'm here in San Francisco with my dinner jacket and seven dollars. Can I come and stay for a few days? And she said, yes, come, quick, come along. So I said, where is it? She said, oh, it's just down the road. It's a place called Santa Barbara. Come straight down the road. <laughs> of course, it took me five days to get there. <laughs> and fruit trucks and things. And I arrived. And for my seven dollars was now about two dollars fifty. I still had my dinner jacket and the suitcase and everything. And um, I stayed there for four or five days. And one day... I looked out of the window, and there, bobbing about on the bay, was HMS Norfolk, which was a British cruiser who had been in Bermuda when I was there about six months before. And I had been best man of the flag lieutenant when he was married, and I knew all the officers on board. So I got in a little boat, and I went out there, and they, <laughs> they, had a, they were there for two days. And they were going back. They'd been up to Canada, and they were going back through the canal and going back to Bermuda. So they, they gave a farewell party, and I put my dinner jacket on, and I went to the party, and... <laughs> And the anchor came up at about two o'clock, and everybody had to leave, so everybody left. And I said, well, I'd better go now. And they said, oh, no, you stay with us. So I was, sounded rather attractive, thought, really. <laughs> so I, uh, I said, well, all right, where do I sleep? They said they gave me a place to sleep, and I tucked in. And I woke up in the morning feeling pretty dreadful, I must admit. My, in my dinner jacket, of course. And I, there I was, a civilian in a dinner jacket, in one of his majesty's ships on a Sunday morning... <laughs> and I broke surface like a great seal coming up through the ice. And I, in the middle of prayers, they were all up there singing. <laughs> and I was pushed down again by a petty officer. And I, How far out to sea were you? Out of sight of land. Well, which is <laughs> and far big, enough. Porpoises <laughs> whiz, whizzing around us all the time. And somebody said, well, you must go down to the wardroom now. The officers want to see you. And I thought, well, I, I thought I was going to be told to walk the plank or something. And I went down there. Nobody said anything about why I was on board, why I had a dinner jacket or anything. And then uh, they gave me a, some little sort of rectifying fluid of some sort, made me feel better. And then they said, the Admiral, a man called Admiral Drax, wants to see you. I thought, well, this is it. This is shot at dawn. This is the end. <laughs> so I went down to the Admiral's cabin, and he said, do you have lunch? And I said, thank you, sir. He never mentioned my dinner jacket or why I was there. And I thought, this is, I, something happened last night. I, I drank the wrong thing or something. <laughs> so anyway, um, I sat down to lunch, and a sailor came in, and he said, uh, HMS Bounty off the starboard bow, sir. And I thought I was going to die. I just read this mutiny on the bounty book. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the Admiral said, Oh, Niven, look out of the starboard scupper and see if you can see her. So I poked my head out of this window thing, and there she was. Guns going off, people in pigtails, <laughs> and Clark Gable on it, and a few other people. I didn't know too late. And th then, of course, it was a put up show. They knew they were going to meet it. It was a publicity thing that Metro had arranged. Uh, and it was the old British battleship meeting the modern British battleship, and the Admiral said, This is where you get off, Niven. And I was. Lowered over the side on the end of a rope in my dinner jacket. <laughs> I arrived in Hollywood on the bounty. <laughs> well, you came in on a hit picture anyway. Uh, David, I know that uh, you're British, and uh, but how did you happen to start your acting career in Hollywood instead of over in England? Pure financial necessity. <laughs> you mean you were rich in England and poor here? Well, I was in the army in England. I went to Sandhurst, which is you know, the same yeah. as your West Point, and I was a regular soldier. And then I... In those days, you could resign your commission if it was dull. It was very dull in peacetime, and I resigned mine and went to Canada. And then I came out here, as I said, by these series of strange mistakes. Yes, and now you're and in a hit picture before you start in pictures. Now, how did you really get started in pictures, then? Well, I then arrived with Frank Lloyd. He was yeah. on, this, on this boat, on the boat. And he had yeah, this... he was directing the picture. Yeah, and it, this was a press war yeah. outing. And in fact, Bill Mooring was there yeah. at the time. He witnessed this horrible arrival of mine. <laughs> and... Um, Frank Lloyd and Bob Montgomery were there for some reason, I don't know. And they said, where do you want to go? And I said, well, back to Santa Barbara's where the rest of my props are, my clothes and everything. So, so they said, we'll take you up as far as Metro and you can get a bus. <laughs> so I drove up to Metro and I swept in through the gates of this enormous studio. My dinner jacket was now five o'clock in the evening. <laughs> Onto the foot of Eddie Goulding, I got out of the car. <laughs> and he was told this story by Frank Lloyd. And he said, well, I want somebody to play the drunken younger brother to Ruth Chatterton. In a picture he was just going to do. He said, will you make a test? I said, if you'll lend me a suit and put me up for the night, I'd love to. <laughs> so Goulding didn't lend me a suit. He put me up for the night. In the morning, I was there, my dinner jacket, nine o'clock. And, um... This <laughs> tired dinner jacket. Oh, it's grey around the collar. <laughs> what happened to this dinner jacket, incidentally? Well, I think I still got it. <laughs> I can only well, say I... this proves uh, why British men are supposed to be the best dressed in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> 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 Lloyd Sloan. Well, I only 
Lloyd, Excuse me, Sidney. I was going to uh, say go ahead, something. Sidney, go ahead. I was going to say that this only proves to all those aspiring actors listening in how you break into the movies. Just give well, it it uh, may oh, I say a word? It isn't quite as easy as that because uh, um, I did this test, which is absolutely dreadful, but Mae West saw it and wanted me in a picture of hers, and I got myself an agent, and I borrowed $200 from him, and I went and got my clothes from Santa Barbara, and I got myself a place to live, and there was, I was just about to sign... And the day before, there was the tramp of heavy feet, and the immigration people called up me and gave me 24 hours to get out of the country. Again? They had seen the yeah. test. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is... I was on a 14-day visitor's oh. pass, you see, and, of course, I had no right, whatever, to take a job, which I was just about to do, which I must say I didn't mean to do. I mean, to do anything really naughty. <laughs> so I was, I was put on a train. I went to, to Mexico. That's right. You, uh, you washed dishes in a you certain were... kind of a house down there, didn't yes, you? Yes, yes, in a place called the Owl. Bar oh, place. Uh -huh. <laughs> Where was that, Mexicali? Mexicali. Uh -huh. And then I came back in with a, with a quota number and it allowed me to work. And by that time, the um, picture had been finished at May West. Goulding had gone away. Frank Lloyd had disappeared into the hills. And I became an extra quickly. And I was English type number 4,008. <laughs> <laughs> David, had you, excuse me, had you thought of acting in England or was it just an idea that hit you when the financial necessity arose here? It, it, I, it was, yes. I did done sort of uh, amateur theatricals as we all have done, you know? Mm-hmm. Not all. I haven't. You haven't? Didn't no. You must You're the one. Uh, Hank Weaver has. Well, you've been back making pictures in England since uh, you came to Hollywood. I know. Uh, I have. Well, what, uh, what are the major differences between Hollywood and England now? Do you think you can account for any? Well, I've always been there, loaned out by my boss, Sam Goldwyn, you see, uh, and sent over there on an ordinary loan out deal, so I never came up against any of the financial difficulties. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mr. Niven, may I interrupt? I'm sure this is all mad and wonderful, and I'm not being facetious, really. But I would like to get personal, if you don't mind. I'd like to know how you met your wife, who is supposed to be the most beautiful woman in the world, incidentally, as if you didn't know. I quite agree about that. Well, anyway, I, I was doing a picture for Corder, called Bonnie Prince Charlie, which hasn't come over here yet. And um, I'd been dismissed for the day, and I, and I had a horrible blonde wig on, and a kilt, and a few other things, and I was delighted to be leaving. I got to the gate, I'd taken all these horrible things off, and the gate man said, you're wanted back on the set. So I went back on the set, furious. It's now 20 to 6 or something. Tired. Where's my chair? I said, I did the full movie star routine. And they said, oh, there's somebody sitting in it. And I looked up, and there was this beautiful girl we were married 10 days later. <laughs> oh. I gave her hell, though, for being in the chair for a while. <laughs> Dar Smith. Well, David, you, you were under uh, contract to Mr. Goldman for these 14 years. Would you really go back to work for him, like you just said you would, even if he gave you good money? I think uh, uh, the money, no object, of course. <coughs> um, <laughs> but I think that Sam Gowen is without question the greatest producer in Hollywood. And if he asked me to work in another picture of his, I can't wait to go back. The only reason I wanted to get away was because he didn't use me in his pictures and he lent me to other people. David, the whole world by now knows that Sam Goldwyn's famous for his somewhat distorted phrases, better known as Goldwynisms, like the famous include me out or it's a lovely day to spend Sunday. Uh, <laughs> can you think of some uh, that he said to you personally that haven't been used? There must be. The only one that was ever said to me personally was uh, when I went off to the war in 39 and I wrote Sam a a note thanking him for all he'd done, hoping for a bonus, which I, I didn't get. And um, <laughs> he was very pleased with this thing, and then he was very sentimental about it, and he asked me to come and see him to say goodbye, and I went in there, and Jock Lawrence, his publicity man, yes. was sitting there. And Mr. Goldwyn said, that, David, this is the most private, wonderful letter that's ever come to me. This, must, this is so private. Jock, I want this letter to leak out to the press. <laughs> 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 the only one that ever happened to me. <laughs> That's a lovely one. Uh, Mr. Niven, you sort of skipped casually over this uh, moment ago. I would like to know whatever happened to Bonnie Prince Charlie. Weren't you making it for two years, two years ago? Well, the picture was, I think, from the moment they first started to photograph anything to do with it until the time it was finished, it took two years. I was actually over there five months. Mm -hmm. And it's been released in England and just been released in Canada. And it's coming here in about two months, I think. Frankly, I'm anxious to see you in kilts. Well, I've worn them all my life. I was born in the Western Highlands of Scotland. <laughs> Sydney? Well, David, here's a minor grievance I'd like to take up with you. 
A motion picture star usually gets a chance to read a script and give his approval before accepting the role in the film. In fact, as your countryman, William Shakespeare, said, the play's the thing. If that's so, then why do you actors in interviews give more credit to directors than writers? I mean, you're always saying the director did this, the director did that, and, and you never mention the writer. It could be that the directors give the jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the producers give the jobs. Well, <laughs> they all help each other. <laughs> yeah, they help it, but the writer helps it, and he never well, gets the let break. Let me say this in self-defense about myself, yeah. that, that only last Sunday... You was, played Walt Shakespeare. I played Shakespeare at the Screen Screenwriters Guild. You did a wonderful job. Too. Oh, that was beautiful. And um, I was Shakespeare trying to sell Hamlet to a producer. I'm all for the writers. Well, good. That's, I'm glad to hear that. Not that I'm a writer, you know. But, but I think I, was, I think this. I think the, I think the era was of the big produ of the big directors, then of the big stars, and I really firmly believe it's not going to be the big writers. It should be. It should be. That's what I feel. David, there's something that I've wanted about for a long time. Uh, you've been in America all these years. How is it you've never become a citizen? Well, that's that's a very leading question. That's a question that, that I always seem to get asked whenever I'm going from England to America or from America to England. And and uh, I have lived here in your country for 15 years, except for the six years I spent in the British Army during the war. And I think I just have to tell you the truth. I, I am the man who likes to have his cake and eat it. I'm profoundly proud of being British, and I love living in America and working here, and I love my friends here. So until they tell me I, I can't have it both ways, I'm going to go on having it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. What about uh, the taxes in this situation? Well, I pay my tax here where I work. And you, don't, you have nothing in England, then? No, no problems, no. Mm -hmm. I have problems. Well, but I guess the government really doesn't care. Our government, that is. <laughs> Get off taxes for a minute, David. Uh, you're very rarely seen in public. I assume that you confine your social life to private parties. Uh, is there a good reason for this? Well, I, th I like them much more, honestly. I, I hate noise. And I think you can choose the people you <coughs> rub your elbows against. <laughs> private parties, and you get out of these other places, you never know what's going to happen. I'm a terribly bad dancer. And, and I get very hot in those phases, too. Didn't they teach you how to dance at Sandhurst? Oh, yes. Sword dances and things like that. You can get me anywhere on the strip. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd Sloan, back to you again. No, oh, one, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. We should have thought... No, we... <coughs> I never answered your question about the difference between working in England and... <coughs> Julia and Maggie, no, we no, well, why doesn't somebody that pick that up? I like Lloyd picking Lloyd up. Pick it up it right. it Go ahead. Still. Well, actually, David, I never got an answer uh, to what the differences are between working in England and here. You mean beside money, the working conditions? Oh, yeah. Well, I, d I didn't mean to brush it off or through, but, but um, I think the first thing is that it's, it's a much more highly paid job as far as electricians, carpenters, and, and that echelon of studio workers goes. is much more highly paid in this country, in America. And I think that a, a much more intelligent class of man goes into it here. And um, the labor troubles are enormous in England and never seem to get solved. And the time taken on pictures is is out of all proportion. And therefore the expense is that much greater. Well, that speaks well for Hollywood, David. I'm glad to hear a good word for it for a change. You uh, sound bitter, Mr. Skolsky. Me? Never bitter. David, the, when I left you on the last question way back there, you were walking out of Goldwyn's office and going to war. And I know you had a remarkable service record. I mean, a sort of cloak and dagger stuff. A movie hero without the camera going. Uh, would you mind yucking a little bit about it? Don't be modest. Well, I've nothing to yuck about, honestly. I was, I was, uh, I think if you volunteer and, and, uh, you're there, it doesn't matter whether you're lucky enough to do anything, you can't do more. And I think, I, miserable people I met were the people who volunteered and found themselves pulling out teeth. 500 miles behind the lines or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and what did I you saw do? A lot you of didn't it. pull any teeth, did you? No, I, I saw a lot of it, of course, from Dunkirk on. But I, I'm, I have one sort of phobia about talking about the thing, because um, can I tell a tiny story? Well, certainly. I, sure. I wasn't in the Ardennes battle because the British Army wasn't involved in it, thank goodness. And I went down there. I had a letter from a friend of mine in New York. And she said, if ever you go near, and she mentioned this place in the Ardennes, Will you try and find Charlie's grave? This is the son's grave. He was killed there. 
And I, I had some leave, and I went down, and I looked for it. And in this valley, she said, and what I found, of course, was 24,000 graves. And I thought, there's 24,000 very good reasons why I should always keep my trap shut about the little tiny bit I contributed to it. It's a very, very wonderful nice story. story. Mikkel? May we uh, have a little more levity? <laughs> you have a great reputation as a practical joker. Not the ordinary run-of-the-mill kind, but uh, I just wondered what, uh, what gag gave you the biggest boot, personally. I think... Oh, it sounds awful to tell them over, doesn't it? <laughs> Sometimes. It's a Not the way you tell them. <laughs> Years ago, we were making The Prisoner of Zender, and I had a very small part in it, and I very nearly never worked again after it at all. <laughs> and um, we had three or four hundred extras dressed as dukes and duchesses, all in resplendent clothes. In those days, Sydney, this is right, isn't it? You've got... Three dollars if you didn't speak, and you got eleven dollars if you did. I yes, think. that's so right. If you, if you had a few lines. Yes, yeah, so if anybody came on the set and know. said good morning, the whole set said how are you, and they that's all got eleven dollars. Right. <laughs> terrible shambles. And I saw all these people, and I noticed something that day about extras, which depressed me ever since. And that is that they are always in complete agreement one with the other. If they're not allowed to speak, they're always nodding, and they never <laughs> <laughs> snarling at each other. So anyway, I, they were circulating around this big bowl of punch. So during the luncheon interval, I put 11 bottles of Raymond Massey's gin into the, <laughs> into the punch bowl. And everybody got $11 about four days. <laughs> Can you think of another one? Oh. Give me time. <laughs> oh, it's not something else, ask. I think <laughs> it's going to be all right. Oh, that was so good, though. Yeah, that was very cute. Yes, we're, 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 we're quite short here. That's, well, that's the reason I looked at the clock. It's all been going very... I still want to get in about your friend... <laughs> Trubshaw. We're 20 even, aren't we? What is that? Well, how about cirrhosis by the sea? Nobody's asked that. Oh, there's some wonderful stories connected with this very good friend of Mr. Nivens. His name was Trubshaw, or is Trubshaw. Yes. All right, let her, uh, let me bring his name into it. Oh, even what we just did. I just got me taking Yeah, well, I can sort of say something about that. Hitchcock is in a scene and so forth. You bring in a friend. Lead into it from the practical hey, from the practical you? joke. You could say and uh, and you could say and and in those in some of those practical Ooh. jokes, wasn't there? You I have thought of another thing to do with the practical with the war, joke? which is I mean, nothing oh. to do with me. as any kind of a man who did anything good, which is which is really quite interesting. If, if, if yes, yes, yes. Let's roll. All right, right. you want to go back and do it? How do you want to do it? Yes. Um, uh, let's, uh, how are we going to get into this now? Well, you could say, if it, uh, something like that, if it's something that doesn't affect you as being a great big frightened colonel. <laughs> uh, is there anything else? Uh, is, somebody might say, well, is it, is it very light? Is it light? Or It's, it's very interesting. It's, 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 I tell you exactly what it was. It was a... That's it. Yeah. Yes, I think it's it's it is. Yes. Yeah. Then you'd have a hard time That's following right. it there. Uh, to, to either follow or to proceed it, because yeah. I remember you let in it. Very nicely. It was good for you, you know, mm -hmm. what you said. Yeah, it was good. Um, on, on this uh, Trubshaw guy, I could say something about Hitchcock has his uh, little trademark, you know, where he's always in a scene. Mr. Niven always gets the name of okay. Trubshaw into it. Oh, oh, take off. You just pick up any way you want after the... Uh, yeah. The what has he Listen, said? Listen, one thing. Did, the, well, the thing about um, the citizenship, did that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Very honest and very understandable. Yeah, and understandable. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, that's very foxy of you to know that, but uh, yes, I do. There's... <laughs> Travshaw is a man who was in the, in the regular British Army years ago with me, and he's six foot six, and he has a moustache that's so big you can see it from the back on a clear day. <laughs> <laughs> and he's splendid. And Travshaw was always in trouble. And, and uh, for instance, we were stationed in Dover Castle, which is a great Gothic pile on the south coast of England at one time. And uh, Travshaw and I were confined to barracks by the colonel. We were both second lieutenants. We were confined to barracks for some small misdemeanor than what it was. Mm-hmm. And we were sitting there, rather miserable in this castle all alone, and in came a general called Sir Harrowood Wake, a frightening-looking old gentleman, great bristling moustache. <laughs> and he said, show me round. Well, we'd only been in the place about three days. We'd just come back from Malta. We didn't know where anything was very much, so... Travshaw suddenly developed into a terrible sort of head waiter. He said, oh, follow me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, terrible thing. We went off. We didn't know where anything was. We were making it all up. And finally, he got a little bit suspicious. He was followed by this staff. He said, what's that building there, Travshaw? So Travshaw looked at it, and there, in letters of fire written on the door, was firehouse. So Travshaw said, well, good Lord, the firehouse written on the door. Get it out. He said, get the engine out. What sort of an engine is it? So Travshaw said, oh, it's a great big red thing. It's got... Piles of hose all over his... What, get it out, he said. So Trapshaw said, yes, sir. Um, Mr. Nevin, get the engine out. <laughs> so I nearly dropped dead, and I said, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Sergeant Major, the engine, get it out, will you, please? So the Sergeant Major went green, and he said, very good, sir. Corporal McFarlane, get the engine out. <laughs> Ask Corporal McGuire, get the engine out. Everybody's giving... Nobody had a key. Nobody had the faintest idea how to get it out. And the general was going blue, great veins standing out all over him. He said, get it out. And Trapshaw went on elaborating while we were waiting for something to happen. And he said, oh, we put out a big fire the other day, so down in the village, a lot of people were saved. Get it out, said the general. So finally, the most ignominious thing of my career, a little man arrived with a screwdriver from the, from the armourer's department, and he unscrewed the lock, and Trapshaw pushed the thing, and he opened it with tremendous flourish. He said, the fire engine, sir. Two women's bicycles. <laughs> it all never had been a fire engine, ever. <laughs> I can see how you'll fell in love with Travishaw. I I love his (laughs) moustache. Why is he in every picture, though? Well, it just became a sort of trademark. I I thought it brought me good luck. It's brought me some good luck and some terribly bad luck. But I always bash his name in there. (laughs) He's your personal Harvey. (laughs) (laughs) Have you heard from him lately? Does he know he's in the picture? Oh, yes. He always says, wait, I'll sue you when I need the money, he says. (laughs) (laughs) Certainly. Just had his option picked up. (laughs) Well, so much for our Hollywood press conference. We'll be back in a minute and grant Mr. Niven the opportunity to quiz our four Hollywood reporters. But first, let's listen to Mel Hunt. Here's a warning to you listeners. Some of you are heading for a fall unless you're careful. Did you know that half of all fatalities in this country are caused by falls? See if these danger points apply to your home. Do you have handrails for all stairways? All ladders and porch stairs in good repair? Are small rugs tacked down or skid-proofed? Are halls and stairs well-lighted and free of tripping hazards? You can easily tell from this checklist what certain types of dangers are. Whenever there's a question of safety, remember always play it safe. Don't take chances with America's number one accident killer, home accidents. And now back to our moderator, Hank Weaver. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to your reserved seat at our coast-to-coast Hollywood press table with our guest star, David Niven. Mr. Niven has just been interviewed by Dar Smith of the Los Angeles Daily News, Mikhail Novak of the Philadelphia Bulletin, Sidney Skolsky, syndicated columnist for the New York Post, and Lloyd Sloan, Hollywood Citizen News and Movie Life magazine. Now it's time to shift our press conference into reverse and entertain a few questions from the very entertaining Mr. David Niven. (laughs) Hold it. I keep thinking of trap shots. He has millions of trap shots. Oh, yes. Uh, this is the first time that I think, this is where you, All right. where you ask the gentleman. Okay, I'll read this. Well, the, <laughs> he he broke them up. Why don't you say that? No, I don't uh, believe that. I just say I keep thinking of trap shots. Really? Yeah. Let him have it. Yeah, I was all right. I was fine. Maybe I said it. No, because we said catchphrase. You said catchphrase. No. We'll come on the same level. No. Unless you do even yesterday. Okay. Because he comes, he's got a very serious thing to ask. Let's well, see. listen, I don't have to. We can ask a gay no, one. Go what do you think? Go ahead, do it, Hank. Bill, why don't you, 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 you get a wild track on, on uh, I was thinking of Trump Shaw. Uh, 
Well, about how are we on time? Well, well you have, have questions for us. us. Oh, I have questions. Oh, wow. Oh, now, this is where our oh, palms get sweaty. Oh, brother. I'm going to go down no, I, that certain kind of house is this no, the, sto- the story, the war story. I wouldn't tell you. The certain, do it now. But you uh, what I was going to tell you, then, I was sent for by MI5, which were our spy people of the British Army, and I asked if I could impersonate General Montgomery. And I said, well, apart from the fact that he's five foot three and I'm six foot, it's the easiest thing in the world. But it's not the story. But I had to find a man and train him okay. to impersonate Monty. Yes. Oh, the double. Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah. I, I, I did the whole thing for that. No, okay. and the man goes round to the oh, music hall, giving me screen that. credit, saying that I trained him. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll open the whole thing. If I can, I'll well, let him say afraid. the other thing. Well, let him just well, try it and say I keep thinking of this, and then and let him do it the other way. Anyway, we'll no, I'll do the whole thing straight. We all set. No, I mean, let him just do that, and I mean, if it comes out. Now, you understand, he's, he's, going to, he's going to throw it to you, Mr. Nidden. Yeah, And then right. you're going to come back and ask him. Well, now, have you thought of anything else? That you no, I just thought that one, and then the one you suggested, I'd put in, if you like. I've got one, anyway, and it, I'd like to hear the answer, anyway. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to your reserve seat at our coast-to-coast Hollywood press table with our guest star, David Niven. Mr. Niven has just been interviewed by Dar Smith of the Los Angeles Daily News, Mikhail Novak of the Philadelphia Bulletin, Sidney Skolsky, syndicated columnist for the New York Post, and Lloyd Sloan, Hollywood Citizen News and Movie Life magazine. Well, now it's time to shift our press conference into reverse and entertain a few questions from the very entertaining David Niven. Well, I have one question I would love to get the answer to. It's this. Is it now bearing in mind that that a news story, and a good news story, must be the most important thing to a newspaper man, or the finding of one, and the dispensing of it. Bearing that in mind, isn't there anything that can be done by the finest of the news people, newspaper people, news people, paper, what am I talking about, the newspaper people here, to counteract what seems to me to be a sort of campaign to denigrate Hollywood and to knock it, to mock it, and in fact, ruin something that many of us have worked very, very hard for a long time to make good. Is it necessary that if something like, all right, an illegitimate baby, just because it happens to happen in the movie colony, does it have to be a worldwide shambles? Can't it be somehow, not hushed up, I suppose, but does it have to be played on and bashed on? As long as people are in the limelight, it has to be played up. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be played up. It just automatically plays itself up. Well, you well see, I, I, I want to go into that a little bit. It doesn't automatically play itself up. Somebody's got to start it. Somebody's got to put it into the papers. Well, but if the demand weren't there, David, they wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't go into the papers. In other words, if the readers uh, didn't want that stuff, there wouldn't be any point in printing it. See, Obviously, they do eat it up. We have people in the newspaper business who very carefully check circulation figures each day as to and compare them to what story was played up most that day. And the uh, story that was played up best and sold the most papers is the most readable story and thereby becomes the story that sells the most papers, therefore is the most popular story. Well, now, I speak with a tiny modicum of experience as a newspaper man because... Just after the war, Lord Beaverbrook, who owns, you know, the London Daily yes. Express, mm-hmm. wa- cabled me and asked me if I would write a column on Hollywood. And I was very flattered that anybody should ever ask me to write anything. So I proceeded to do it. And I wrote two, and I cannot think why, but they went down very well indeed. Then I suddenly realized, of course, in my case, it was hopeless, because I was going out to dinner with my friends and going back home and writing about them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and pretty soon I was running out of friends, and, and so I... Stopped it quick, and I'd be, be, Brooke was very nice about it, and he, and he uh, let me off. But in the meantime, I was made a member of the foreign press here, and pretty soon I got the, the press handouts in the studios about their people, including, believe it or not, my own about myself for my studio, which came through the mail. And it was pretty dull. I've never read such nonsense in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, Maybe this and, is part of your answer. Well, now, is it part of the answer? Because well, now it's we're, part we're of it. And yet it's not the whole answer. I mean, a newspaper, uh, putting out a newspaper is like putting out a number of pictures at a studio. And they've got to put out, they put out various types of pictures, 
and they put out various type stories in a paper, and it's the type of picture that sells that they keep making or that you want to make, and it's a type story that sells papers that they play up or that they think sells papers, and they check pretty well. Now, getting back to uh, the illegitimate baby, as you termed it, or the Bergman baby, as a matter of fact, that didn't happen in Hollywood. It happened in Italy, and Hollywood shouldn't be censored for that, and isn't, I don't think. And, I don't, and, of course, as a matter of opinion, I'm Bergman on that thing. But uh, the story is being played. It might be uh, being played too much, but it, but it is news, and there is a certain amount of interest in it. Good night. May I lean on this a little bit? Am I yes, being no, go ahead. Right ahead. Um, also, I seem to pick up my paper every day, or my papers every day, yeah. and every single day... There is featured a divorce in Hollywood, and nine times out of ten, there are people I've never heard of, and I've been in the industry for 15 years. But it always is that Hollywood thrown in with a divorce. That's right, and that's done. I agree. I think that's done a little too much, and uh, it, uh, it goes back to the old, uh, old days that I know that any girl that ever worked in a Ziegfeld show, if she got drunk or was in an auto accident or in a scandal, it was Ziegfeld beauty in this. Yes. And now anyone who's ever... Uh, Oh, had a license to drive a car in Hollywood and played an extra in a picture as a Hollywood movie actress. And that part is a little unfair. And when you get to the story, I, I think people of some taste and uh, that have some brains realize that. And I think uh, all that stuff finds its level after a while. Well, in my paper, which happens to be the Los Angeles Daily News, we have to prove, if we say a Hollywood star... Uh, gotten a jam of some sort, we have to be able to prove that this person has actually starred in a, in, in a picture. Well, well, I think well who has uh, to prove it down the paper, <clears throat> Da? The rewrite man who handled the story. Well, will he know? Well, well he, can, he can check his, uh, his record books, just like the sports record books. Anyway, all may I have <laughs> yes. tiny let promise. Mr. Niven get back in, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, can I just say one thing? Yeah. I think I, I read somewhere that the New York Times put the, the original Bergman story on page... Seven or eight inside, and a lot of and uh, a lot of papers didn't play it down that much. But on lesser stories, say that uh, that don't merit that much importance, I think a lot of papers today are uh, handling them a little more carefully than they have in the past. And I think Dar's point about the news, and I think uh, our paper, the Citizen News, uh, does watch them rather carefully. There are a lot of papers that go in for sensationalism, and they are the ones that probably always will do something like this. And, even uh, our agreeing that it's wrong isn't going to change I think it, it gets down to a matter of taste and judgment uh, on who's the editor of the paper, the same as who's a producer of a picture. And, and you can make the same story. Well, may I extract one promise from you? Because you're obviously influential, highly thought of members of the society Dear I'm talking boy. about. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> you so much. Please, every time you feel behoven to write something that is bearing down a little hardly on Hollywood, that you will turn over the sheet and write something that doesn't bear down hardly, but bears down well on the same subject on the other side. David, you know me, but We're don't in. get me wrong. I love Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> well, having extracted your promise, Mr. Niven, I see our right. time is just about Isn't up, it and it's uh, time to call a halt and call 30 to another edition of Hollywood Byline. But before saying goodnight, our sincere thanks to you, David Niven, for appearing on this program. Mr. Niven, by the way, will soon be seen in the Powell Pressburger production, The Elusive Pimpernel. And, of course, our thanks, too, to our panel of reporters, Sidney Skolsky of the New York Post Syndicate, Mikhail Novak of the Philadelphia Bulletin, Dar Smith of the Los Angeles Daily News, and Lloyd Sloan of the Hollywood Citizen News and Movie Life magazine. See you all at our Hollywood press table at the same time next week. Until then, this is Hank Weaver saying good night from Hollywood. Listen in again at the same time next week when ABC, over many of these stations, presents another edition of Hollywood Byline featuring an exclusive on-the-air press conference with an outstanding movie star interviewed by reporters whose beat is Hollywood, the film and glamour capital of the world. Next week, our guest will be Kirk Douglas. Hollywood Byline is directed by William T. Johnson and is transcribed in Hollywood. Now, here's a listening reminder. <laughs>